I really want to continue the theme of the presence and the Spirit of God this morning. Is that okay? And we're just going to learn some things. If you've got a Bible or a phone with a Bible on it, something like that, turn to Genesis 28, and we're going to use that to start out this morning. This is that story where uh, Jacob has a dream. He lays down, he's on the run, he's using a, a, a rock as a pillow. Who knows that you're having a hard time when you're using a rock? as a pillow. I think he wanted to make himself feel worse. Do you know when you feel bad, so let's do something to make me feel worse. It's like when you cry and then go look in the mirror to make sure the crying looks good, right? So he's, he's in a kind of, nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows but Jesus, right? He's in a, everything's in minor key. There's no major key. He's having a downer. Anybody ever have a downer? Right? Life gets too much. Stuff just goes on, does it not? And here we find Genesis 28 verse 16. Jacob has this amazing dream from heaven. And listen to what he says when he wakes up. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God, the gate of heaven. Hey, an amazing verse. First point from the verse. Often God is around and we're not aware of it. It's some of the stuff we were dealing with yesterday. It's almost like God is a membrane away. There's something between us and all that heaven can do. But who knows when Jesus died, the veil was torn. You with me? So the membrane, any kind of a veil between God being in our lives and where God is, is nothing to do with him. He tore the veil. But who knows that we, we live dull lives quite often. Anybody on my planet? My greatest issue as a minister is not immorality, it's dullness. The sheer boredom of 48 years of church. Sometimes I think if I just sing one more song. Did anybody get like me? I'm 48 years old, I've gone to church every weekend since I was 10 days old. We were the family that used to go five times on a Sunday. I have heard thousands of church services. I, I, at sermons, I have heard, uh, I've sung thousands of songs. Some of you look like you've been to church a long time. <laughs> a long time. The spirit of rigor mortis is setting in. No, I'm kidding. No, stop it, Jared. I don't know about you, though. I love it when something different happens. Because we just go through the motions, right? But the book is full of God breaking through into our world. Now, if God isn't going to break through, at least do something entertaining. That's what I always think. You know, do you know what I mean? I remember, so, so I went to church since I was 10 days old. And when I was seven, we went to live in the Mediterranean. Tough life, someone's got to live it, right? So I know it was before, I must have been about six because it was when we were still living in South Wales. And I was in a big Pentecostal church, pews. And do, do you still take communion in those little thimbles? Those little Russian shot glasses, do you use those? I mean, you look in them and you think, my cup runneth over. If you spat in it, it would run over. Do you know what I mean? It's like, really generous, Lord. Thank you for my thimble of Ribena. So we had all, and they, they, they put them all in the little holes in the, in the front of the pew. And uh, it was a church of maybe 500, 600 people. And uh, what the pastor would do is he'd read a certain scripture, say a few, usually same phrases every week. And, and then uh, 600 tongue-talking Pentecostals would, would lift up 600 little Russian shot glasses to 600 tongue-talking lips. And we'd all take communion together. But I was too young to take communion. But it was a holy moment. But on this one particular Sunday... Everybody lifted up the little thimble to their mouth and, and, and drank. And my mum was the first. She screamed. Now, the toilets in this place were at the front of the church. So she just ran for the toilets thinking, Pastor's going to kill me. She's running down the stairs to where the loos were. And she's running down the stairs thinking, Pastor, is, what have I just done? And she's feeling violently sick. But then she hears 600 screaming Pentecostals running after her. There were five Pentecostals around every toilet puking. There were little piles of false teeth appearing in the sinks. As people, there was pink puke up the walls. People were just being sick everywhere. The guest speaker was lying on the platform, bubbles coming from his mouth. Somebody had put bleach in the communion wine. No, I thought it was cool. The front page of the paper the next day said, Church believes in inner cleansing. 
I'd love to tell you it was me that did it, but it wasn't. But I thought, yes, I've been to thousands of church services. I've heard thousands of sermons. But somebody somewhere do something different. Either let's have God break through or let's at least be interesting. Are you with me? Don't do the bleach thing, though. You'll get in trouble. Here you find Jacob. How do I get back to this story now? What have you done to me? Sometimes life just goes on. Nothing seems to break through. And as you get older, it gets worse. Do you know what happens as you get older? I can tell you now. (laughs) Science has shown that when you're young, you live out of imagination and creativity. But as you age, you begin to live out of memory instead. And so you don't live 20 years of experience. You live the same years 20 times over. And we begin to live a dull existence. But here we find Jacob... And God breaks in. Listen what he says. Surely God is in this place. And here's the secret. And I didn't know it. Sometimes our senses trick us. And we don't realize God truly in all of his power is with us. And he gives this this amazing phrase. Listen to it. How awesome is this place This is none other than the house of God. Everybody say, the house of God. God. And he then brings another turn to that phrase, the gate of heaven. Say the gate of heaven. heaven. Say with me, the house of God God is the gate of heaven. heaven. Say it again, the house of God God is the gate of heaven. Now, we know the house of God isn't this building. Mark said that a few times this weekend. The house of God isn't the building. What's the house of God? Us, we're the house of God. So what are we supposed to be? The house of God is the gate of heaven. The house of God is a place where two worlds meet. The house of God is where an awareness of another realm of God who can break into our world, and as we were learning yesterday, perform miracles and bring his wisdom and his insight and his help and his strength and his healing into our lives. And the house of God, us and how we are together, can be a gate of heaven where God can break through. The house of God is a place where a door opens and we meet another realm. It doesn't have to be us gathered in this place. It can be us going about our lives in work. Us going about our lives with family and friends. But who knows, we're supposed to be a place, you are supposed to be a place where two worlds meet. And by the power of his Holy Spirit in your life, you're supposed to know, two worlds meet in me. I'm aware of heaven. I'm not going to church. I'm not going to a meeting. I am a meeting waiting to happen. Come on, somebody growl at me. I'm not waiting for revival. I am revival waiting to happen. Why? Because listen, I'm, I'm the house of God. I know I'm it corporately. I know I'm it personally. So I'm the place where heaven meets earth. I mean, boy, when you go to work, class, wherever you go tomorrow, walk in and go, you are blessed that I'm here. Right? <laughs> Right? But here's the great challenge. Are we aware of God's realm? Or are we as many Christians can be with our dullness and an hour living the same year, year after year? Are we fully aware of the availability of all God's power? Church, we are meant to be the place where heaven comes to earth. And I just want to awaken some awareness because if not, dullness can capture us and we can sing Christian songs and we can say Christian stuff and even say Christian prayers. But we've lost the awareness that God is in our lives. The one who parted the Red Sea is in you. You, You're preaching good, Jared. High five. You were made to be a little spot of heaven on earth. Made to be a little place where miracles break out. Where you wake up in the morning, God spoke to me in a dream. I really think that the church in Great Britain right now needs to wake up to a new school of the Holy Spirit. As far as I'm concerned, I don't know where your theology is at, because I know there'll be all sorts of people here coming from different backgrounds. I don't know where you're at, but this is my take on it. If it's in the Bible, I want it. I don't want a British version of Christianity. I want God. Anybody on my planet? 
Yeah. I'm not here to live a polite, uh, a polite, nice... Isn't it funny how British Christians think we're supposed to be nice when the early church was causing riots and we think we're all supposed to be chaplains? People say to me all the time, you know, oh, God, God, God's just God's love. He's love. Which of course he is. That's all they know. They're kind of living off the first half of Ephesians, Psalm 23, and a few political preferences, and they think that's Christianity. No, it is not. One of the greatest dangers right now is the rise of post-biblical Christianity. People who aren't reading their Bible and think their political preferences are Christianity. They are not. We need to get back to the book and back to an awareness of heaven. Let's not humanize this thing called Christianity. Let's not humanize this relationship with God. We need to know what it is to walk in the power of his spirit as he promised. The words are in red. I will send you another comforter. Jesus said it. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. I mean, you, how, how repeated does it need to be that the Holy Spirit comes into our lives and brings a transformation of heaven so that we can use Jacob's word. God is in this place. And come on, I'm aware of it. He's here. That's what happened in Acts chapter 2. There was an awareness of heaven and a beginning to grow in the spiritual things of God. I am the house of God, the gate of heaven. I have found two things more than anything else, destroy the sense of the awareness of God in our lives and the power of the Holy Spirit, Spirit flowing through our lives. If you've got a Bible, turn to, get me glasses on, 2 Timothy. Turn to 2 Timothy, chapter 1. Or head there on your phone, that's cool. And listen to this. It's the Apostle Paul, so spiritual daddy Paul, talking to spiritual son Timothy. Look at what he writes. For this reason, Timothy, I remind you. It's verse 6 and 7. 2 Timothy 1, 6 and 7. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Wow. Let's just stop there for a second. He's saying, this, this apostolic father is saying to young Timothy, Timothy, fan into flame a gift of God that's inside you. In other words, there's supposed to be something inside you that's like a flame. And he's saying, Timothy, it's totally up to you whether it's a great big burning bonfire or an ember. That's your choice. You fan it or you ignore it. It's your choice. Don't blame God. Don't blame the church. It's your responsibility to decide whether you are a great big burning bonfire of a spiritual understanding and spiritual power from heaven or you're a little candle or an ember. The choice is yours. But we are supposed to be, like John Wesley said, I set myself on fire and the whole world came to watch. There is a spiritual dimension when we realize God's made me by his grace a little bit of heaven on earth. A gate between heaven and earth. A gate where people can have their needs met because the power and the presence and the wisdom of God is in my life. And then the Apostle Paul goes on to show, so this is the thing that takes the bonfire and turns it into an ember. He explains, for Timothy, God did not give you a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. The spirit or the attitude of fear takes the bonfire and turns it into an ember. I don't know anything that destroys spiritual lives like fear. Do you know that fear makes many decisions in our lives? Fear often decides what job we have. Fear decides what we study. Fear decides who we do or don't marry. Fear decides whether we can cope with church or not. Do you know that fear dictates how we lead worship and whether the gifts of the Spirit operate in our lives? Fear. There are prophecies in this room that will not be released from heaven because someone is afraid. Do you know what fear does? I hope you can cope with this phrase. Work it out for yourself. Fear takes God and locks him in a box inside you I don't mean he's in a box I mean there's no expression of God through you because you've drawn lines in the sand to say I would not I cannot I'm not able to that's beyond me I'm scared I want to live a safe nice I'll just be a chaplain for Jesus Christianity How many incredible stories of provision, of healing, of wisdom, of care, of evangelism would take place if we said, I will fear no more. 
You, know, you want to know where the adventure of realizing I'm the gate of heaven is? It's in becoming fearless. Not overnight, let's not be silly. But beginning to move the boundaries so that our kind Heavenly Father can begin to grow us into bold, confident people. Do you know that you were born with a lean in? When you were born, you could do anything. Right? My son's nine. He's going to be an Olympian. He's convinced of it. He doesn't exercise at all, but he's going to be an Olympian because he's nine. Right? He could be an astronaut, anything. When I was five, I wanted to be a waitress. I, just don't go there. But when you're little, you can do anything. Why? Life hasn't taught you otherwise. So you just think, I can do anything. You're born with a lean in, a confidence. Mummy, I want. My son burst into my study whenever he wants and asked me for stuff. Usually Haribo's. You're born with a lean in, but then life happens. And slowly we begin to live more like this. Let's see if I can get through this thing without too much pain without making too many mistakes, without being an object of ridicule. I just want to hold it all together, keep my Instagram account looking good, and that's about it. But I don't want people to know the small print in my life, and I certainly don't want to put myself out there. Listen, every great story of man or woman of God that you've ever heard, I guarantee one thing, they've had to break out of fear into a place of boldness and say, okay, God, let's give it a go. Fear destroys destiny. Isolate insecurities or they will isolate you. They will affect your relationships. They will affect your destiny. And if we don't start isolating the inner conversations and going, oh, shut up. Fear. I use the mirror all the time. Anybody look in the mirror and go, Cooper, get your act together. <laughs> go for it. I do not want to live a dull life. I want to live with an awareness of heaven. We... We love to see God move in miracle signs and wonders in our church. And so we give a lot of time to praying and, and our youth give a lot of time to praying. Oh, right across, it's not a couple of heroes, right across the church. We believe in prayer and in healing. And sometimes we get TV crews come in and do stories, BBC, people like that. And they come in and they do stories about healing. If you studied RE, you would have the opportunity to watch a little 20 minute film of our church in your RE studies at GCSE. And they did a whole piece on healing and revelation at our church. Now we get different Camera crews come through, and I remember this one time they were coming through. They interviewed loads of members of our staff, and I was the last interview of the day. And they came, and, and I was there showing them videos of people being raised from the dead around the world and healing, and I was just laying it on thick, having fun. They weren't Christian, but I thought, let's show them what the Christian world is like, because really, they're not going to believe it. And as I'm there sharing with this camera crew, it's pretty evident that the girl with the boom mic thing, you know, the fluffy toy, right, the sound girl, right, she's evidently ill. She's got some kind of head problem. She's having scans and she's worried that it's something really quite sinister. And I'm there doing all my bit and I've finished. And then I head off to the kitchen to get them some drinks. So I'm heading off to the kitchen and I get halfway to the kitchen. And all God has to say to me is, well, then. <laughs> See, this is what we start to do. But God, you know, they're not Christians. You know, what about, you know, your, your, your glory might be sullied by me getting it wrong. As if God's worried about that. But God, they've got cameras. I mean, it'll just spoil everything I've just been showing them if it doesn't work. And God just doesn't answer. Complete silence. Yeah. So all I'm left with is that, well then. Yeah. And I'm making the drink. <laughs> it's one thing to talk the talk. Who wants to walk the walk, right? And I get all the way back. And then I put the tray down in my office and I, and I look at them. Then stuff starts coming out of my mouth. You ever had that? I go, well, obviously you're not very well. Why don't we pray for you right now? And she said what most people say when you offer to pray for them. Oh, yes, please. And then it came out my mouth. Why don't we roll the cameras so you can get it for the film? And I'm like, ah! <laughs> what are you doing? She said, yeah, that's a good idea. I'm like, it wasn't my idea. She sits down. And I just put my hand just a few inches from her head. And they roll the cameras. And all I can hear is the camera there. And I just pray, Lord, would you reveal your presence to this young woman? Would you heal her of whatever is affecting her head or her mind right now in Jesus' name? And we just sat there quietly for about a long, quiet minute. And then she opened her eyes, and this is what she said. Well, that's freaky. I said, what's freaky? She said, I can feel this peace moving through my body. So that's the presence of God, but how's your head? She said, the pain left the moment you put your hand near my head. 
For what was left of the day, I saw this wobbly boom mic as she was shaking and trembling under the power of the Holy Spirit move around the building. Miracles are just the other side of a little act of obedience. They're just the other side of stepping through our fear barrier. That membrane is so thin. God is in this place. I wasn't aware of it. But if I step out in boldness, usually in church life, somebody somewhere has to break ranks and go, okay, I'm going to take responsibility for this miracle. Do you know why? God is into relationship. That's his value. And so his method is always partnership. He doesn't want to do miracles without you. And so when you read the pages of the Bible, you will always find man involved in the miracle. Moses has to lift his staff. Naaman has to go wash in the river. There's a man's thing to do. And sometimes it is just God saying, well then, offer to pray for her. Don't let fear make you dull. We need to eradicate fear. A friend of mine, an apostolic figure, he planted hundreds of churches, but now he's getting older. His wife had just died, so he was newly Widow word? Is that a word? Widowed. Not widow word, but he's a widower. You can have. Anyway, I'm not very good at this talking thing, don't worry. And he's walking past a nightclub one evening. He's the sort of guy that would always be in a suit with a huge donkey choker of a Bible, right? It's a massive thing. He's walking past this nightclub and he's a proper Pentecostal, a man of God. And he's walking past the nightclub and God says, Go in the nightclub. And he's like, oh, God, I have never been in a den of iniquity in my life. (laughs) I mean, this guy's like 70, you know, and I don't intend to start now. So he has a little argument with God outside the nightclub in Pretoria. And eventually he gives in and he walks into the nightclub and he walks in and he views the dance floor in front of him. And there's people dancing and right in the middle of the floor is a woman that looks everything that she is. She's a prostitute. And God just whispers to him, go and dance with that woman. So, oh, Jesus in the name of Jesus now. So he rumbled, you know, if it had been church, he'd have gone, sing a loud song, I need to talk to God. You know what I mean? He has a little argument with God and eventually he makes his way out onto the dance floor, still with his suit and donkey choker of a Bible. And he goes up and he stands next to the prostitute and he begins to, to dance like only a granddad can dance. You know, you know, and so he's, he's dancing there. And then God says to him, ask her if she wants a drink. And he's dying inside. He says, would you like a drink? Pardon? Would you like a drink? Eventually he gets her over to the bar. He orders her whatever she wants. He told me that he asked for a glass of milk. I don't know if he ever got it, but he asked for a glass of milk. And he says, look, I want you. He said, look, I'm a local pastor. I'm really not here for anything to do with your services because they already got that conversation out of the way. He said, I just feel led in here by God. Can we meet somewhere public tomorrow? Maybe a coffee shop. I'd love to hear your story and I'd love to tell you mine. Can we meet? And so he met her the next day in a coffee shop and heard the story of abuse and rape and drug abuse. And there in the little coffee shop, he leads that prostitute to Jesus. And a work begins that sees hundreds of prostitutes led to Jesus. All because a 70-year-old man in his churchy suit was still alive enough to hear when God broke through and said, just pop in there for a minute. I've got something for you to do. But he had to give up his barriers of fear. Like all of us, he had a good argument. Really? Are you sure? It's going against everything I've ever done in my life. At some point, we have to break through fear and step into the purpose that God has for us. Learn. Let it be an incremental thing, almost certainly. To become bolder and bolder and more confident. Why? Not out of cockiness or self-assuredness, but out of a sense of the love and the grace and the care of our Heavenly Father. I think many give up on an adventure of the Holy Spirit thinking that God will only ever ask me to do wild things like pray for camera crews or go in nightclubs when I don't want to. The truth is I've always found God to be a really caring father that teaches me well and incrementally and sensibly and just gently keeps stretching my boundaries until I walk in an adventure with him. You can give your heart to Jesus He wants to lead you on an adventure that is your adventure. He doesn't want to turn you into someone that isn't you. He wants to turn you into the best version of you possible. That's our God. Fear. When we get to the end of this service, I'm going to ask people to stand. And we're going to pray, God, eradicate fear in my life. 
I want to become the boldest, most confident, and that usually means, if you're doing it well, most loving version of myself possible. With your help, I want your spirit to guide me on an adventure. There's a second thing that stops us walking in God's adventure too and being a place where heaven meets earth. Turn, if you've got a Bible, to Numbers 22, one of my favorite scriptures. We did this one earlier. And it's Balaam. Balaam is a, a naughty prophet. And um, God sent an angel to strike him down because he's being a bit naughty. And, and the donkey that he's on uh, turns to the left, turns to the right, sits down. And Balaam, the prophet, imagine him in his big robes and his big white beard. He's getting angry. So Numbers 22 from verse 26 onwards. Then the angel of the Lord moved on ahead and stood in a narrow place where there's no room to turn to the right or to the left. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, it lay down under Balaam and he was angry and beat it with his staff. Then the Lord opened the donkey's mouth. I always imagine Eddie Murphy from Shrek at this point. All right, just put that. Then the Lord, what are you doing? Right, then the Lord opened the donkey's mouth and it said to Balaam, I would have run at this point. I don't know about you. What? What have I done to make you beat me these three times? Balaam answered the donkey. You've made a fool of me. If I had a sword in my hand, I would kill you right now. The donkey answers Balaam. Am I not your own donkey, which you've always ridden to this day? Have I been in the habit of doing this to you? Balaam loses the argument with the donkey. No, he said. Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes and he saw the angel of the Lord. I just love this. Here's why. If God can open the eyes of a donkey to see into the spiritual realm, work with me. If God can open the mouth of a donkey to win an argument with an experienced prophet. Now understand, the donkey had not been to Bible school. The donkey did not know Greek or Hebrew, did not understand the chronological differences between Ezra and Nehemiah. It was an ass. It hadn't had a quiet time that morning. It didn't pray in tongues for an hour before getting the revelation. It was a donkey. If God can open the eyes of a donkey to see into the spiritual realm accurately and open the mouth of a donkey to win an argument with a prophet, here is the deep, this is about as deep as I get, here's the deep truth that tells me. In God's eyes, any old ass will do. I'm just working on the religious spirit. God can use anything. Anyone. The, great, the second greatest thing, fear, I believe, is the first. The second one, shame and self-disqualification. Others. Others will write the books. Others will have the stories. Other people on TV, spiritual people on platforms. And we self-disqualify from the world of heaven meeting earth where we live. Dreams and prophecies in our lives. Miracle signs and wonders in our lives. But listen, God can do it with a donkey. We qualify. You might feel broken. You might even feel a bit dysfunctional. Join my club. I spent half my life dysfunctional. But I still see God move in miracle signs and wonders. We've got to stop thinking that other people's lives are as good as their Instagram accounts. Of course they're not. Don't compare your small print with my headlines. I'll take you to the times I lie awake at night, two in the morning, going, God, am I doing this church thing right? I tell you the story about the BBC coming around, but I don't tell you when I lie there going, I don't, it's just not going very well, Lord. No one got saved this month. What's going on over there? What about the year just a few years ago? When my, virtually my only prayer for an entire year, 2014, was God, will you heal my broken heart? And that was the only reality of God I needed in that year, was God, I'm broken hearted. And I need you to help me. So I'll keep doing my job. But inside, you need to pour oil into this shell. Heaven needs to meet earth. And I found again, as he's proved again and again, whoo, You could tell I was trying to think of a joke, weren't you? It didn't come. It didn't come out. Oh, Jesus, I'm tired. It's my sixth preach this weekend. Oh, come on. Come on. I'm working hard here. I love you guys. I hope I've helped you. You know, listen, if you ever want to find ministry easy, you've got to understand anything to do with a platform or being in front of people, just always stand up, even a presentation in work or, or studies, always stand up thinking, I'm just here to help people. I'm not here to impress. Yeah. And you'll, it takes all the stress out of it. Yeah. So I'm just, I'm just here to help, and I hope I'm helping. Yeah. Yeah. 
You know, shame is one of the most useless emotions that we have. Does it, not in any form does it come from heaven. God only ever brings conviction, which is a convincing that I need to change that. It was that, and I'm going to change my mind or my behavior or both and do this. God doesn't come just going, I just generally feel hopeless and bad. I've got this dull gray guilt sitting in my life, which means I'll sing the songs because at some level I feel it's right to be in church. I'll listen to the sermons and I'll nod. I'll even say amen. But this dull residue of guilt lives on. Let me tell you something. Jesus came to wash away the membrane of shame, to wash away the self-disqualification and the imposter syndrome that everyone's more spiritual than me, and to make us realize God has only ever worked with broken people. He takes broken people every single day across the planet and makes trophies out of them. And I just wish, actually, that more guys on platforms would glorify the goodness of God in their weakness. I actually wish that maybe more of us leaders led with our limp instead of with our great stories. Limping always leads to relationship. In other words, you know, guys, I've been in and around this 48 years, and I'll be honest with you, I'm doing this limping. But I just find the more I lean on his grace, the more powerful everything gets. I don't, mind it. I don't mean that I'm in some terrible moral place. I just know this. Even when I'm doing well, it never feels like good enough. So I have to sit back into grace and let God be God. How's about we wash away shame and self-disqualification? You, no matter what you feel. I don't care about your feelings. Your feelings change. Attraction. Anybody get hangry? Anybody there now? Feelings come and go. Eat pizza and you'll feel different. You can't live by your feelings. Neither can you live by your own thoughts. Don't believe everything you think. Let's start getting our minds around his word and our hearts around his presence. And maybe a little bit of heaven on earth will break out inside of us. Then we're ready to walk out into this world and not sit in a classroom or a lecture room or in an office, or at a reception, or at home, changing nappies. We won't go about our duties thinking, well, God's are far off. We'll realize, wow, he loves me. I qualify. You know, he made you for one reason. Work it through with me. There's only one reason you're still here. He loves you. He doesn't really need us. He chooses to work with us. Why? Well, it's a bit like when I wash my car with my nine-year-old. I do it to be with my nine-year-old. And he washes, and then I really wash. (laughs) So we go out into the world carrying Jesus. He just wants to be with us. He says, don't you worry. I'll really do the work. Goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. That's our God. Should we stand in his presence? Have you got something? Come on. Close your eyes for a moment. Fear, shame, self-disqualification. You were made to be a little bit of heaven on earth, but those things keep us from coming close. If you know and you want to say like me, God, I want your spirit to become rich in my life. I want your voice to become a powerful and clear part of my life. I want to understand the ways of the Holy Spirit. Then as we close, I want you to walk out from where you are and come and stand at the front here with me. We're going to pray together. And I believe the Spirit of God is just going to pour over your heart. The Spirit of God comes to amplify the voice of God and bring us an awareness of heaven. If you like me saying, God, I want to eradicate fear, then come on, step out here with me. I want to become bolder. I want to be the most confident, loving version of me possible. I want to get rid of the stinking thinking. I want to get rid of shame. Come and leave shame at the altar this morning. Some young man here struggling with the area of lust. Can I just guarantee you one thing as a 48-year-old man? You're not going to be the first guy that God's helped through the issue of lust. Come and bring it to God's altar. And let him teach you how to become a holy man in his presence. And leave the shame behind. It's not going to help you at all. But growing in his presence and in his word will help you. Just place your your hands out in front of you. 
satellite dish position. <laughs> Let's connect heaven and earth in this place. It's not the building, it's you and God. Spirit of the living God. Let his presence fill you. Right now, whisper your prayer to him. Get rid of fear. Timidity. Some of you here are meant to be bold as lions out on the street doing evangelism. I see healings taking place on the street. Some of you, I see you talking to your neighbors over the garden fence and just bringing a little bit of heaven to your neighbor. I just see some of you are going to have little moments of, I'd even call it gentle confrontation in the lecture halls and with, with other students and with lecturers. And I just see you bringing a little bit of heaven to earth. And he wants you to walk into that university confident that God is with you. He wants you to be aware of it. Aware of it. Aware of it. Father God, we speak to the spirit of fear that turns the bonfire into an ember. And we say we don't want it. Repeat this after me if you can. Fear, I don't want you in my life. I want boldness, confidence, love, strength mercy and grace God fill me with your Holy Spirit I rebuke the spirit of fear and I receive the spirit of God I will grow in boldness every day until my adventure looks like heaven on earth shame leave my life you have no purpose. I refuse to harbor you. Leave in the name of Jesus. I am qualified to be filled with the Spirit, to hear God's voice, to move in miracles, to see the world changed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, help me to live a great adventure with you. In Jesus' name, amen.